Hi, Robert. Hello, Garrett. You managed to get on the platform? Yeah, I was on and then um, I saw my computer, the, the speakers weren't working, which just reminded me I should reboot it just in case. <laughs> Okay, then I think uh, we can get started. Um, so uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, last plenary of uh, USIPCO 2020. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Robert He. He's a distinguished professor in the Department of uh, Electrical and uh, Computer Engineering at the North uh, Carolina State University where he moved uh, recently. Uh, Robert uh, received his PhD from uh, Stanford University with Professor Paul Rush. He's an IEEE fellow, also a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. His uh, expertise is actually at the intersection of uh, wireless communications and, uh, and signal processing, and he's actually very active in, in both uh, societies. He also works on both uh, the theory as well as uh, the practice of wireless communications, and related to the latter, he has very close contacts and collaborations uh, with industry as well. His uh, research topics uh, focus on basically everything related to MIMO, and we will hear more about that also today, with recently also a more specific focus then on, on millimeter wave communications and even higher uh, frequency uh, communications. And in all these areas, he has received a lot of recognition, got several journal and uh, conference paper awards. He has more than 70,000, so 70,000 citations on, on Google Scholar and, and an H index of 129, so very impressive. And personally, uh, I, I know Robert since uh, yeah, 1998, so more than 20 years ago already when I was uh, visiting as a PhD student in Stanford. At that time, the atmosphere was kind of uh, competitive, so we didn't interact too much at that, at that point, but uh, afterwards we became uh, good friends and we meet regularly at, at conferences and we collaborated on some joint papers. And of course, we, we have a lot of fun also at, at social events, which if it's up to Robert should always include some kind of uh, karaoke uh, singing. I'm not sure if he's gonna also do that today, we will see. Any, anyway, so uh, let's move to the talk. So uh, Robert is gonna talk about uh, what is next in, in signal processing for MIMO communication. So we will hear about what to work on in the in the near future. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat uh, or you can wait till after the, the presentation when we can uh, handle them uh, live. So uh, go ahead, uh, Robert, the floor is yours. Excellent, uh, thank you Eric, for the, the kind introduction there. And I, I'm glad things didn't get too competitive in 1998 and we both survived uh, somehow. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, great to be here virtually. I, I have to say I'm really sick of being at home, so I would kind of rather be there, um, wherever there is. I've really lost track of where the conference is supposed to be held at this point. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's great to, to be talking and um, it's a little early for me, but uh, I had a nice shot of espresso before the presentation, so hopefully it will go um, quickly. So I wanted to, to talk about what uh, I think is next in terms of MIMO communications. And this, uh, this talk itself, I spent um, a fair amount of time, you know, revisiting what's been going on in the literature the last um, several years and, and trying to bring a, a perspective together uh, to present to you. Um, and this is joint work with uh, my postdoc, Dr. Miguel Rodrigo Castellanos and Professor Nuria gonzalez Prelchich, who's also at North Carolina State University. So just um, real quick, so many of you probably uh, know me from UT Austin. Uh, I moved to North Carolina State in uh, August. It's a strange time to move in the middle of a pandemic, but uh, one, one of the things that yeah, I wanted to do was, was to be in a place where I could uh, start something myself. And North Carolina State has the uh, core expertise in areas like circuits, uh, communications, networking, and I saw an opportunity to do something really big and timely with respect to the next generation of cellular systems. And so I've, um, with the colleagues, I'm leading a group there called 6GNC, 6G North Carolina State University. So we're looking at new technologies, some of which I'm going to talk about today, 
uh, applications to um, aerial vehicles, ground vehicles, um, artificial intelligence, immersive um, gaming, and even topics like agriculture robotics. And then finally, new kinds of infrastructure. And signal processing is a core part of um, our vision in, in for 6G. I think it's, it's an incredibly important tool. So I'm gonna start off with um, a bit of discussion about what's been happening in MIMO the last um, seven or eight years, let's say. In particular, looking at millimeter wave MIMO communication. And then I'm going to um, look at three different directions that I think are uh, promising for the next 10 years of, of MIMO. So I'll start off with, uh, this is the uh, short introduction to MIMO communications. For, for those of you in attending the SIPCO that maybe don't come from the SBCOM uh, background. And this is a slide that uh, we originally created for uh, a plenary that I had at the Acelobar conference, but I, I really like the slide and I've been reusing it in a lot of presentations since then. And so the MIMO communication that is about communicating where the transmitter has multiple transmit antennas and the receiver uh, has multiple receive antennas. And you take advantage of those spatial degrees of freedom uh, to do different things. And the traditional application of MIMO, the one that got everybody excited in the 90s, was uh, about spatial multiplexing. And I wanted to illustrate that concept here without too much math. Um, so you can think about a standard communication link as this purple truck here that's driving along with a payload of bits. This slide was more funny, when I guess, when I was at um, Texas because we had more pickup trucks there and more bits, I guess. The, uh, and you can imagine this is a single lane road and the truck is driving along. Now what um, spatial multiplexing does is it's like adding lanes on top of the road. So you can imagine here there's now a highway and the lanes are built on top one of another. And so they take up exactly the same amount of road space, but you can now send three pickup trucks with three payloads of bits. And this kind of configuration looks pretty crazy, but, but actually in downtown Austin, that's how the highway looks. Well, only two stacks, not three. Um, and, and by the way, they spent 20 years building that um, to get this improvement here. Now, from a um, rate point of view, what you really care about in wireless systems, I and mean, there's different metrics. The one that uh, we use a lot is the rate per user. So this would be typically bits per second, Per user. So it includes the spectral efficiency, includes the bandwidth, and then this MIMO spatial multiplexing gains. So this, in this illustration I have here, that would be a factor of three. And the bandwidth is determined by the width of the road. Um, the spectral efficiency depends on the SNR, SINR. Um, it, if we were looking at Shannon's equation, that would be like log of one plus um, SNR. And then finally, there's something here about the users. So if you have, um, you know, let's say you had a, a system that had 100 users, each with a really awesome MIMO link. Well, at least from a spatial multiplexing point of view, you would end up time sharing or otherwise dividing the spectral resources among the users. And so there would be a, a penalty in the rate per user for the number of users. Now, the, the net, though, is that spatial multiplexing, it, it gives you val more value to your bandwidth. Now, what millimeter wave did, so millimeter wave MIMO communication has been um, an area of active research since I would say around 2003 or four when millimeter wave was um, starting to be viewed as a, a new technology for cellular systems. And what millimeter wave does is it, it's really just targeting the bandwidth part of that equation by um, going to millimeter wave carrier frequencies you can essentially make the lanes on this highway bigger. So now instead of having one lane on top of each other, now we have three lanes and three lanes. So um, bandwidth is a great way to improve rate um, because it is um, scaling linearly with, with the rate per user. So in principle, you know, increasing the bandwidth by a factor of 10 should increase the rate per user by a factor of 10, um, subject to many caveats and assumptions. Now, there's um, different aspects of millimeter wave MIMO though. One of, one of the things about millimeter wave was the use of very large antenna arrays. 
And that provided an additional array gain efficiency that wasn't apparent, at least to us when we were initially working on the problem, how beneficial it could be. But it turns out that larger array gain, not only does it improve the signal quality, which is what we were expecting, but also reduces interference. And um, it tends to be, tends to create a link that um, can be even better than as predicted by the higher bandwidth. Uh, in, interesting uh, side discussion we could have, but uh, that would probably take another 45 minutes. Now, the other dimension of MIMO that's been really active in, in about the last um, seven or eight years as well has been massive MIMO communication. And uh, there's many different perspectives on what exactly massive MIMO is. Um, my feeling is it's multiple user MIMO where there's a large number of antennas at the base station and large could be as small as um, 32 or it could be more than that. Um, we probably have massive MIMO experts on the attending the plenary that can add more to that and you know perhaps debate exactly what massive is. What massive MIMO does, what was interesting from my point of view in this analogy I'm giving you is that it really targets the, the number of active users part of the equation. So instead of using the spatial degrees of freedom to send um, a lot of data to one user, it's using those to multiplex in space data among different users. And so what you can see here is that I've got these three trucks here, but now um, they're all going in different directions as they are intended for different users. And, and so what happens is that you're not getting the spatial multiplexing effect, but because you're sharing the channel among multiple users, it, you're, instead of increasing the numerator, you're decreasing the denominator, which has the same net benefit. And there's other interesting aspects of massive MIMO. It can be combined with millimeter wave, um, or it can be used as envisioned initially was at lower frequencies. So I wanted to highlight um, these two areas here just because I, I wanted to explain that um, in the last seven or eight years, I mean, looking at um, these new kinds of MIMO, there's been uh, a rich application of signal processing tools. You know, this is a signal processing conference. So one of the um, areas that have been of interest for me has been in um, the array architectures. So in, in the um, 2000s, when we were talking about MIMO communications and we drew that MIMO block diagram, um, we really had envisioned that all the processing was happening in, in DSP. And there was, uh, the antennas were connected to the DSP through mixed signal. For example, at the receiver, there's an RF chain, pair of ADCs, one for in-phase, one for quadrature, and all of the signals are, are processed together. And that was really the de facto approach. And um, that's what implementations were based on. And most people were looking at that. Now, when millimeter wave came along, so millimeter wave pushed the need to have um, much larger arrays because you needed those arrays just to get array gain to overcome the shrinking antenna size. And that encouraged, um, you know, larger and larger arrays operating at higher and higher um, sampling rates because the bandwidth was higher. And that creates a power consumption bottleneck. And so one of the ways to solve that was using what's called an analog architecture or a hybrid architecture where some of the digital signal processing is actually pushed back into analog. And I say back because if you look at the original work in array processing in the 60s, it actually was an analog. So at some point it went into digital, then it went back here into a hybrid form. And so that changed um, the split of signal processing among digital and analog. It created new constraints and, and opened up a whole new set of problems to be solved that was different than the original ones we were looking at in MIMO, which made this implicit assumption of uh, everything done in digital. Now, the, the hybrid architecture has drawbacks in that there's a, the, the reason it's if power efficient is there's a dimensionality reduction. So maybe you go from 64 antennas down through four RF chains. Um, and so there's, there's a huge um, compression operation happening there. Another approach to reducing power consumption, and, and this is one that is especially relevant at the receiver, is to um, reduce the resolution of the ADCs because high resolution ADCs operating at say giga samples per second consume a lot of power. So reducing the resolution down to one or two bits can um, make that power consumption almost negligible at the penalty though of um, 
potentially causing a lot of noise and other nonlinearity effects. And what there's been a whole line of, of signal processing that has developed around this idea of embracing that nonlinearity and building algorithms that um, are designed specifically for one or two bits of, or three bits of quantization error instead of um, six bits and pretending that the residual is noise. So what are, what are some of the um, more specific developments that have happened? Well, one of them has been that um, sparse channel estimation uh, found a new set of problems. So this idea that I mentioned about the dimensionality reduction and the hybrid beamforming and combining, um, you can think about that like a compression operation and then exploiting the, uh, the inherent spatial sparsity in the channel, you can decompose the channel as a function of dictionaries as determined by the array um, response vectors. And then by sending pilot information over different combinations of RF precoders and combiners and accounting for this dimensionality here, you have what is essentially a sparse estimation problem. And so this became, I think, uh, a really um, interesting application of uh, tools from uh, compressed signal processing and one that uh, got a lot of attention also from, from industry. Now, I would say that at the end of the day, what's in 5G doesn't really exploit any of this, which is, which is a huge shame, uh, but there is still potential for that. And I think it's, um, as the arrays get even larger, there's still opportunities there. Now, another area has been, oh, I don't wanna skip over this one here because maybe this is the one everyone's waiting for, um, machine learning. So machine learning for communications has been big topic for the last few years. And um, essentially Garrett was saying, you know, if I don't have anything on machine learning that he was gonna cancel my talk and in invite someone else. So I had to dig up something here. And uh, so machine learning, I, actually we've been using it in, um, to do work in MIMO communication for more than 10 years. So it's not really a new topic, but um, with the power of deep learning, I think um, many people are realizing how it can be used to solve um, very complicated problems. And so one, one of the problems that we've looked at is this idea of um, besides compressive channel estimation is also beam training. So how can you um, train a network such that you can recommend beams that work well for the blue car when it's in this location where um, there's different traffic conditions. So sometimes the direct line of sight beam is blocked, but another one is unblocked. And instead of trying different beam combinations, can you develop a recommendation engine that will say, hey, when you're over here, try these five pairs of beams. And most likely one of them will work instead of try a hundred and um, you'll find the right one eventually. And so there's been a lot of um, general connections there between machine learning and MIMO that exploit the features of these. Um, in this case, is more targeted towards millimeter wave, but also for uh, massive MIMO communication. Another one is um, uh, message passing. So the, they're a tool um, that became uh, really interesting also around the same time in uh, 2010s is this uh, generalized approximate message passing. Um, Cindy Viranga and Phil Schneider have uh, developed a, a number of papers on this as, as well as others, but it, it's a powerful extension of approximate message passing that allows um, you to look at problems where there's memoryless nonlinearities. And in the example I gave you before, that one bit or two bit quantizer, that's a memoryless nonlinearity. And so this was a, a really just interesting theoretical tool that turned out could solve um, these problems in low resolution channel estimation really efficiently. So that was another um, thing that the, these MIMO problems and another connection with signal processing. It's also um, other tools as well. I mean, Bayesian estimation, Bayesian learning right now is um, really popular. And so there's been work on using um, this Bayesian principles here for, uh, example like uh, channel tracking. And some of the challenges here have to do with uh, adapting to the, um, the changes that in the environment. So not just looking at cha small scale changes, but also incorporating um, blockage due to dynamics and adapting over time. Uh, and, and so this has become, you know, it's, it's another application of signal processing tools that seems to solve a very uh, relevant problem um, 
in this case, channel tracking. And by, by tracking, you can reduce the number of measurements you need to estimate the channel or the number of beams you need to, to track. So now um, I, I hope I've convinced you that just thinking about um, millimeter wave, uh, mass and MIMO have, um, it, it's brought a lot to the signal processing community and signal processing in turn has um, advanced the, the technology there. So there's a, now in the, the remainder of the talk, I wanna uh, go through three directions that I think are, are gonna be important for MIMO in the next 10 years. And the first one is going above 100 gigahertz towards terahertz. Now I phrase this um, in, in this slightly awkward way because in, you know, if you look at Wikipedia, terahertz uh, is officially 300 gigahertz to three terahertz. But um, most of the papers that are coming out in um, our area consider terahertz roughly starting at 100 gigahertz. And, and probably we should call that the sub terahertz band. And why 100 gigahertz is that the spectrum has, at least in the US, has been heavily regulated up to 95 gigahertz. And so above 100, there are some loose regulations, but the spectrum has not been auctioned to anybody. And, and there's still, to some extent, a wild west there. Um, there's a, a fair amount of unlicensed spectrum. There's a lot of spectrum being used for passive sensors. So there's, um, there's opportunities there. And just like, you know, in the frontiers in America, I mean, you could go there, build something, and then, you know, make a city around it. And so there's opportunities to go into this terahertz band and, you know, maybe build a, a new communication network and demonstrate it works and get that um, spectrum. So why go above 100 gigahertz? Well, at the end of the day, the reason to go above 100 gigahertz was the reason to go above um, three gigahertz. It's just um, access to more bandwidth. So that's what I explained on maybe the third slide here. So when you go up into the terahertz band, um, say right around 300 gigahertz, there's about 160 gigahertz of spectrum that uh, allocated for communications. And this, this is based on the recent WRC 2019 uh, meeting where they discuss worldwide spectrum policy. And, and in, even though there's some holes in that spectrum, those holes are filled by some of these passive sensors. And you can even communicate in those bands as long as you have some uh, emission respect with what the, the passive applications see. So if you are um, if you were near a place where they're doing weather observation, then maybe you wouldn't be able to communicate. But if you're far away, then it's OK. So other applications going above 100 gigahertz. I mean, it, one of the other attractions of, of terahertz is beyond just, you know, maybe a 60 type application is also very short range length. So high data rate. So terabits per second between, um, between chips, between uh, servers and a data center. Um, and terahertz could provide those data rates to, to replace the wire and have some advantages in terms of reconfigurability. And also when you start going to these higher bandwidths, and as I will make the case in a moment, <clears throat> even larger arrays, you also um, have the ability to start understanding the environment even better. And so it becomes possible to do uh, imaging and uh, communication at the same time with the same RF array. So that, that's something else that, that's exciting. And, um, but at, at the end of the day, my um, somewhat less optimistic perspective is that a lot of the, a lot of what's happening in terahertz is also about what's happening in millimeter wave. Um, so as a result, my my students right now are busy rewriting all of our papers by searching and replacing gigahertz for terahertz and uh, republishing. So um, if you get one of those papers, I, I do hope you will um, accept it. So. Um, you know, what, what, what are some of the special things about terahertz? I mean, I just told you that terahertz is just millimeter wave, but, but there are some features that will lead to changes in the algorithms and may, may lead to new applications of different signal processing. Um, the, the one that's the most closely related to radio uh, engineering is the um, <clears throat> extreme peaks of absorption due to different aspects of the atmosphere. One of the reasons that, that uh, terahertz is used, for example, to, uh, as, a, as a means of chemical sensing. So can you detect if the presence of a bomb um, without having like a bomb sniffing dog? Uh, you, you can use this absorption properties and send a you know, wireless link between two points and, and decompose what, what's in the atmosphere is pretty cool. 
So some of the um, things commonly found in the atmosphere, like water, have different resonant frequencies. And so it means that, that in that terahertz band, there are places where the attenuation is super high. So it might be OK in the data center for links of um, or centimeters or maybe a meter, but you probably wouldn't want to do um, even tens of meters, let alone hundreds of meters there. And the places where there's not so much attenuation, these are called um, communication windows. And, and there's a number of them I illustrate here up to um, one terahertz. And you know, there, there's still hundreds of gigahertz available that, that has um, very little atmospheric attenuation. Now, the main consideration from my point of view is that, okay, so when you go to higher frequencies, the, um, and, and you're using these efficient radiating antennas just as an example, the effective antenna size shrinks. And this is why um, free space path loss, which I've illustrated here, increases as a function of frequency. It's basically just because the, the antenna gets smaller. So the way that you can um, avoid that loss is by having roughly the same aperture size, which means that you have an array of antennas that are roughly the same size as the lower frequency antenna um, that you're comparing with. And when you go from three gigahertz to 10 gigahertz, Maybe you need a factor of 10 more antennas, but then there's yet another factor when you go to terahertz. Uh, and so significant amounts of array gain are really needed uh, just to overcome that effect. Not to mention when you go to terahertz, you might have 50 gigahertz of bandwidth. So you need to get a good SNR. So you also need array gain for the SNR. And finally, the output power of devices at terahertz can be um, typically much lower than at lower frequencies. So you also need to overcome that um, hardware constraint as well. So essentially, um, you know, from a, a channel perspective, terahertz just leads us to want to do um, even more MIMO with even bigger arrays. And just as an example here, terahertz, it, th this is not some completely crazy wireless communication technology. There's actually already a standard called 802.15.3D for short range communication links that operates in the 300 gigahertz band with 60 gigahertz of bandwidth. That's not a typo, up to 60 gigahertz. So you can get huge data rates in, in that band. Um, that said, there's no devices yet because I think people are still trying to figure out how on earth to make it. But at least there has been thought put into the channel there. So what are some of the challenges? I mean, one of the things that struck me when you know looking into to terahertz is that there's this interesting, what. Um, was called in the literature the terahertz gap in that there's um, it, it's not so efficient to generate and process terahertz signals with electronics because of various semiconductor properties and yet the terahertz frequency the the wavelength is a bit too large to use optical components and so there's been this gap in the middle there and that gap may be filled by this new area of um, plasmonics, which is about using uh, waves excited in a particular way on, on sheets of graphene to make um, incredibly small arrays. But, but the net of this is that generating and processing terahertz signals may be different even than what I showed you for, for millimeter wave. And so just uh, as a reminder here, so this is what a typical, you know, reasonably abstracted block diagram for radio would look like. I'm not showing the in-phase and quadrature components, but hopefully you remember that. Um, so you have a um, mixer, a filter, a power amplifier. Um, one of so the the challenges here is just that as you go up in frequency, the phase noise goes up, and the power amplifier efficiency goes down because the as I mentioned before, the the different semiconductor processes as highlighted over here um, don't necessarily give as much output power here, and so that's a uh, that's the conventional approach. And for, for hundreds of gigahertz of carriers, actually, this will probably be fine. So the work in 100 to 300 gigahertz, the electronic generation may still um, be OK, though it may be difficult to get the higher bandwidths with this um, strategy. Now, here's another approach. Th this one, I um, was first exposed to this by, by Dennis Prather, who's referenced down here. But um, another weird approach to to doing terahertz is instead of you know up converting to a successive series of frequencies eventually two terahertz you actually go from baseband to optical and then down convert 
um, deter Hertz. And that can happen, this is called um, photonics. And, and so here, the data is modulated into essentially an optical signal. The optical signal is amplified and then passed into a photodiode. And remember, a photodiode takes light and is outputting current there. And so the photodiode does the conversion into RF frequency here. And, and so this has some in, intriguing advantages in particular that you can um, distribute signals very efficiently using fiber. The drawbacks are that to get a lot of output power, you need to use lasers and lasers are big. You can't imagine having your phone with a big fat um, 24 lasers in there, not realistic here. Um, but this could be a solution for longer range terahertz lengths um, when you, you have that um, ability to have that power. So this other strategy, this is one that has been um, under development for about uh, 10 years, uh, is this idea of, of plasmonics as um, I highlighted this earlier here. And so the idea is to excite this wave in, in a metamaterial, which could be graphene. And the, these little, uh, it's called surface, um, actually I can't even see it with this thing here, plasmon. Polar, polariton, you're seeing that I'm a little bit sleepy now here, waves at the surface of the materials then can create the terahertz waves through that excitation. And, and the, the advantage of this is that um, it, it also works with very large antenna arrays. Um, it's potentially extremely configurable. You can set up um, different polarizations, different kinds of um, different bandwidths, different, and you can have very compact arrays. Um, and, and the disadvantage of this is that um, it, it seems to have been maybe experimentally verified, yet there's not really much work on e even an, an antenna made with this technology yet. So um, it, it could be really interesting, but this might even be like a 7G technology. If, if we don't even have antennas yet, it's hard to, to fathom having, you know, MIMO working with plasmonics maybe in the next five years, but it could come. And I think each of these architectures opens the door for, um, so potentially some new signal processing by thinking about what happens when we, like in this case, what happens when we change the architecture? Um, so this is an example of a, um, a, a terahertz signal generating block diagram. So this is introducing so many different components. Um, so for example, the optical phase shifting, what does it have the same constraints as RF phase shifting? Uh, what are the limitations of the modulators? Maybe there's different kinds of distortions. Um, and so I think that there's an opportunity to look at these architectures and then maybe to come up with some new uh, system models. And I was thinking of doing that for the, the talk. And then um, I thought, well, I don't have three years of research to, to get it all done. But I think it's something that is, is definitely worth doing. Um, another thing is that as you go to the larger arrays, and if you're using just a very conventional beam steering solution, the beams tend to get much narrower. So these ideas of efficient beam training, for example, using machine learning, become even more important because the beams are so much more pointy. And, and this is an example we got from uh, a recent paper where we plugged in some values for a millimeter wave set of assumptions and terahertz, assuming that you did this initial access over um, the pointy beams. Now in practice, you do some sort of a hierarchical search, but it really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, the access time, um, it, it ends up being about the same. And, and so if you search over enough um, rays large enough that would be of interest at terahertz, you know, you, you could just be um, minutes and minutes um, doing the beam training and it's not feasible. Though, I mean, maybe in a data center is totally fine. Uh, but it does encourage, you know, thinking of the use of, of like position information. Um, and I should point out that that standard I mentioned before doesn't even have any beam training. I, I think because they just first saw that um, it, the beam training was so difficult, they just didn't specify it. So it's assumed that you set up, maybe you manually um, in, implement the beam training yourself when you deploy that 15.3D system, whenever that happens. Uh, so some other... Um, She's as well here. So other implications, uh, looking at um, near field. So when the arrays get um, there, it's small, but they're, they're high dimension and then they're close together, then you can't neglect the, um, the spherical property of, of the waves. So normally we treat the waves coming in as plane waves. And one of the weird things 
that happens is that when it's spherical, so now um, the channel is slightly different between every antenna and they're related by the distance, which is a function of the transmit and receive location. And if you think about the plane wave assumption, the actual proximity from the receiver to the transmitter actually disappears there. So you know its direction, but you don't, how far away it is is not a function of the model. So that's a difference that happens with near field. And then if you get even close together, at terahertz, probably not going to happen, but at lower frequencies, then you, you start having to look at near field electromagnetic effects, not um, far field. But there's a lot of applications at terahertz that, that may end up being near field. And so we'll need to look more at these kinds of signal processing models, not the, the far field ones that have dominated the MIMO literature. So the other thing is that um, the arrays uh, become, uh, you know, it, it, more important at terahertz, but then also the, you know, how do you make those arrays? What is the geometry of the arrays? How do you ensure that the link is robust to the um, depolarization effects in the channel? And so the, the arrays themselves start to become more important and uh, the, the effects of the pattern, the effects of mutual coupling and the effects of um, polarization, both in terms of the antenna elements, the arrays, the orientation, and the effects in, in the channel itself also um, need to be considered. And you know, I would say probably 99.9% .9 of my work, we assume that the uh, transmissions and receptions are um, co-polarized, but in reality, there's um, some, uh, there's, there's decoupling in the channel and the antennas themselves are not isotropic, they do have a of polarization. And so there's need to look at that. Now, the, the interesting opportunity here for signal processing is that this creates, um, you can rewrite communication channels with polarization really nicely using um, tensors. And so there's some cool applications of um, tensor race compressed sensing. And, and if you think about all the ways that tensors are um, part of machine learning. So I think there's a big opportunity here. And the reason people haven't done it, despite it being practical and despite industry doing um, building antennas with, with multiple polarizations and doing the signal processing is, has just been that the, um, the math is harder. But, you know, for this audience, uh, that, that's a plus, not a minus. Okay, and, and this is just something I wanted to show is kind of surprising that, you know, we, all the communication links, um, you, you need to have noise. Uh, we don't have noise-free communication, but um, the usual power spectral density we assume for noise um, is, it's like white, typically Gaussian noise. And if it's thermal noise, the variance um, per Hertz is Boltzmann's constant times the, the temperature. Um, that's actually an approximation of the uh, a true expression, which is, the, which is shown here, that has a, an effect such that at very high frequencies, thermal noise actually starts to disappear. Um, so that could mean that you can communicate even more efficiently at higher frequencies because of the absence of noise um, but then other effects also start to become significant. For example, this, the noise due to the vacuum energy. So not necessarily going to be uh, free lunch anywhere. In fact, it could even, in, in the net of it, could be worse. Um, but it is sort of intriguing that there's a window of terahertz there in the, the 1 to 10 terahertz range where noise could be less significant. But sadly, there will be also a lot of har other hardware impairments there. The second um, area I wanted to talk about is, is um, these new antenna technologies. And these, um, this is really about making um, larger MIMO arrays, both at lower and higher uh, frequencies. And so, um, and, and there's different technologies that are being developed to make this happen. So for example, um, at terahertz, the plasmonic, um, antennas and plasmonic arrays is one direction at, um, and, and so that's, that's also interesting there. Now, and then there's other, and there's applications here, for example, you know, what if you need large gain, large spatial resolution, so making a very big antenna, then this idea is of holographic antennas, extremely large apertures. Or what if you need to have a, a small form factor where the antennas are um, packed reasonably close together as is, is needed in, in SATCOM, then this, this holographic idea uh, plays a role. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these here. So I wanted to expand a, a little on just the, the plasmonic idea. So there's um, these SPP waves are excited, creating the EM wave. 
And the, there's some parameters of the material that are um, selected and potentially optimized to create a certain form factor. It's kind of beyond the scope of the conference and beyond the scope of um, my expertise. So, uh, but I, I gave some good uh, references over here. Uh, but you know, using a plasmonic array and having the ability to change the um, reconfigure the antennas and the bandwidth being used by those antennas really dynamically, I think is uh, it's quite interesting. And this holographic MIMO um, is one of the directions that, in particular, research of massive MIMO is going. There are different terms for what appears to be about the same thing, as far as I can tell. So. The core idea is imagine that you have a continuous surface that you can somehow control to create um, a, uh, you can think of it like a, a, a beam with um, very flexible uh, shape there. So instead of having like three antennas where you control the phases and create the pattern there, you can imagine having thousands of antennas and the limits of just a continuum of antennas that can be controlled. And so you can do some really intriguing types of um, beam forming. And, and one of the directions that has been a lot of attention in the literature is this uh, large intelligent uh, surface. And the, the terms are used in different ways. And so, you know, maybe someone can, even if they want to give their opinion on what the right terms are. I'd be happy to discuss that in the questions there. But from my perspective, large intelligent services are it's where the RF and the signal processing is, is embedded in the surface. So the, the surface itself has got um, configurability in, you know, may, it, maybe it's a, it's a metamaterial. So there's little tiny um, different pieces of, of materials put together that, that can be controlled. And then there's another um, concept which is very similar which I would call um, either reconfigurable intelligent service or intelligent reflecting surface. IRS is probably more common, um, where the surface, you can control the, the properties of that material, um, but it's all passive and, or it's, it doesn't contain too much power. And so you can change the reflecting properties of the material, um, which is good for using that material um, as a reflector, as opposed to using it as a transmitter receiver. And large intelligent surface, um, I view that as more of a transmit and receive array type of, of technology. But this is an, an area that has been really evolving a lot the last couple of years. And, and so hopefully um, we'll get too bogged down on all the different terms there. So, so what can be interesting here? Well, I mean, if you can have um, tons of antennas and effectively a a continuous aperture, there's all kinds of really cool theory. If you look in um, a couple of the papers I cited in the, the previous slide, I mean, there's some really beautiful sampling, spatial sampling theory, really nice. Um, but then it, there's also, uh, and you, you know, all the sums go away, you get integrals. So there's some really cool things there. Um, at, and at the same time though, the way these arrays might be implemented with metamaterials may not yet be captured in that simpler analysis. And so I think there, there's a gap there that can be filled by, by more research. But this requires working with the folks that are building and designing these materials and these arrays. And those people frankly have expertise that's pretty far from what we do. And that's one of the challenges there. These intelligent reflecting services are, are getting a lot of attention to it essentially as a way of um, at higher frequencies having a, a strong, more specular reflection instead of at lower frequencies. Uh, sorry, it, it, as opposed to like a, a scattering where you lose a lot of the signal strength there. And these reflective services could be coding buildings. It could create more multipath in the environment that um, creates diversity to blockages and gives better coverage. Um, so that's one of the main benefits of intelligent reflecting services. Now, the, um, the signal processing itself is a little bit different when you go um, to the surface. I'll show that on the next slide here. Um, and exactly how it works depends on the assumptions that you make about the hardware. Um, but you get, you know, essentially MIMO communication relay type problems that have new, new structure. And so th this is just an example here from a um, nice paper by Wu and Zhang on um, optimizing the, uh, the reflection matrix here to have a MIMO link that has good um, 
performance. And so that optimization, because of the intelligent reflective service is different than if we had just an active MIMO relay in place. So it leads to new um, signal processing algorithms. And, and there's been a tremendous number of papers in um, intelligent reflective services, as well as um, the large intelligent services. So there's other um, aspects of the problem that are, that are interesting. I mean, when you start going to these really large arrays, um, it, it also becomes possible to do positioning even better. And that's been exploited thus far at, at millimeter wave with the somewhat smaller arrays that are at millimeter wave, but um, you go to higher frequencies or to some of these um, large intelligence services applications of, of MIMO, the arrays are really becoming really big. And so what the application of this might just be um, in being able to do positioning for lots of these low power Internet of Things type devices. Uh, for example, um, you know, maybe you have a tag on your keys and you can figure out where your keys are very efficiently here. Um, that, that seems to be a common discussion that we have in, in my house. Where are the keys? Where is my phone? Where are my glasses? Might be an efficient way um, to make that happen. And that happens because of the large um, spatial extent of the array it gives you good spatial resolution. Not to mention if you go to higher frequencies, you also get even more bandwidth. So the last few minutes of the talk, I wanted to, to revisit this idea of, of hardware aware signal processing. Um, now, if you are working in um, on DSPs or uh, it, more on the embedded side of, of signal processing, you're, you're wondering why I'm putting this here because you're already aware of the hardware. Um, but for most of us in, in signal processing for communications track, we've normally made some assumptions about the hardware. In particular, that our friends, the circuit designers have done a good job and things are linear and we can neglect this noise. Um, and, and those assumptions are very reasonable design goals that of course they're not perfectly achieved. And as we go to higher frequencies, larger arrays, the impairments introduced in hardware again become significant. And we can just, you know, press the circuit designers and say, hey, I need, you know, I just, I need the array to be awesome and perfect. Um, or we can try to live with um, the imperfections and come up with algorithms that can help the circuit designer make an even worse array um, instead. And, and so that's the net of why, you know, hardware is, is relevant is that, um, in, in the implementation, I mean, a, a lot of the cost and complexity ends up being in the analog and mixed signal parts. And so we can play a role in reducing the costs of, of the radios by working more hand in hand with the, the circuit designers. And, and this was a topic of interest in <clears throat> early 2000s when, when radios were becoming completely integrated on chip and then um, kind of fell out of favor. But I think it needs to come back now uh, because of the things that I already uh, presented in the slides. And, and so some of the things you happen with real hardware, I mean, you get, you start looking at the antennas as they're not isotropic, you've got phase noise, you've got saturation, quantization, intermodulation, neutral coupling, peak power constraints, radiated power constraints. Um, so these, these introduce um, new kinds of impairments in the signal models and new constraints in the optimizations. Um, and one of the ways that I, I think that we can make progress in this area uh, well, one way, of course, is we just throw machine learning onto the problem and be done with it. Um, on the other hand, we could also try to use our engineering knowledge to understand the problem better and model it better, and then maybe throw machine learning on top. I think circuit theory is, is a nice way to do that because um, you can write the, um, like you, you can write the equivalent effect of an antenna in terms of circuits, and you can write all the components of RF receiver from a, a circuit perspective in terms of equivalent voltages and currents. And, and this lets you have a mathematical relationship that captures more of the physical um, properties of the signal here. So what are some of the implications? Well, one of these, this is a weird one. My, my postdoc has did his PhD on this uh, topic. Um, so it turns out that wireless devices, uh, you know, they, they all expose users to non-ionizing radiation. So when you have, in principle, the phone near your head, your head heats up a bit. And if you have your phone near your head a lot, you get this where you lose all your hair. Um, don't quote me on that. That was just a, a joke. I think I lost my hair for genetic reasons. Um, but what, what can we do for a signal processing perspective? Actually, you can do beamforming that pushes the signal away from the head so it doesn't heat up as much. 
Um, and what this does is this allows manufacturers to pump more power from the phone and, and give um, better performance. And you can write a, even like a, a mutual information maximization problem, how we would achieve the capacity. You can introduce new constraints on um, such that we don't radiate so much into the head. So that leads to interesting new mathematical problems. Um, another thing is if we start looking at this combination of these um, large intelligent services plus accounting for things like, well, maybe we want to use uh, one bit DACs or ADCs or, or two bit. Um, what is the impact of that? And th there are some interesting, because the, the low resolution is nice because we have this extremely large array, you know, you still have to get the, like the signal to and from. And so having that data converter with low resolution is interesting. We did some, some work on this already that looks at spectral efficiency um, with uh, like the ideal case with one bit DAX. And, and so for example, one of the signal processing aspects that was cool was that the dithering effect used in vector quantization can improve performance with the one bit DAC. And I mean the dithering before the, the DAC, which is interesting. Um, yeah, in general hardware impairments, I mean, you, you can model each of those impairments and estimate them. That's one approach. Or you could try to estimate the aggregate effect of that, those impairments. So for example, my colleague Nuria ha has looked at this for the sparse channel estimation I showed you before, where they accounted for different kinds of mutual coupling and array geometries by using a dictionary learning approach to, to learn the new dictionaries where the signal was sparse and to improve channel estimation performance. And then um, just wrapping up here, the last technical slide, um, one thing that's really fascinating to me is that this idea of that bandwidth um, is sort of decoupled from the other dimensions of the problem actually is not true. So, so antennas themselves don't radiate equally well at all frequencies. And so there's an interesting effect which is exploited in tightly coupled phased arrays where you, you put antennas closer together and the bandwidth of the array actually gets bigger. And so we, we've been doing some work where we've been designing antennas, looking at different configurations and um, optimizing in this case for the effective radiated power, not the power into the array, but the power that comes out of the array. And got some interesting results about how, you know, actually having the antennas closer together can give you better performance in the sense that the antenna can radiate efficiently over a much wider range of frequencies, despite you know, the usual design principle, which we would say, well, the, the antennas are spaced um, too far apart. So th this is just something that we need to start thinking more about is the connections between uh, the, 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 the MIMO parts of the problem, the frequency and recognizing that components in the hardware and parts of the theory are actually frequency dependent that we weren't using before. So I went through this, um, I think a, a bit fast because you can see like the espresso started kicking in, it was like an exponential and then right at the end, it's at the peak. Um, so, so what's the net conclusion here? Well, the basic conclusion is that, you know, we're at the, uh, what I think is the midst of a, another renaissance of MIMO communication. Um, I get criticized a lot that, you know, for, for saying that communication theory was dead in 2010 and then of course, continuing to work on it for the next 10 years. It's really good, it's a, it's a great strategy, by the way, because you get rid of all your competition. You say, hey, everybody go over there because that's where the hot area is and you just keep doing your work. Um, sadly, I just gave away everything that I think is interesting, but um, I'm, I'm hoping there's enough uh, low hanging fruit for everybody here. And with that, um, I, I went a little bit over time, but hopefully we can have some questions or I will be um, checking the, the Q&A and the, the chat as well. So thank you. Okay, thanks Robert for this interesting talk. So any questions for Robert? Is that interesting in the British sense, which means it's really not interesting or is it, is it mean something different in Belgium? No, no, I, I think it's like the, norm, the, normal, uh, the normal European sense. <laughs> okay, all right. So I think, yeah, it's a nice, uh, uh, Look at look uh, look ahead and and what what comes up in the near future and uh, yeah what kind of uh, yeah tools we need to to resolve these these problems. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. So I think there's a question. So there. I think yeah, sure. uh, Christian. So I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Robert, for your talk. It was uh, very interesting. Um, 
I wonder um, with this uh, kind of devices and uh, higher frequency, probably a huge number of devices, uh, what is about uh, the um, uh, green computing challenge and the power consumption and so on? So some ecological points of this, uh, this uh, communications. Yeah, it, it, it's, that's a good point. And that does motivate um, a lot of the developments that are happening are coming from this idea of, you know, like it, one of the interesting successes of massive MIMO, if we have more antennas, we can um, reduce the power per antenna, um, but potentially even reduce the power further from that and make it even more power efficient. So it, it's a consideration. And it, it's also one of the reasons to work with the, the circuits folks, because like the data converters um, can consume a lot of power. So if we can use signal processing to maybe save that, that power, you know, that can make the system more efficient. Of course, if we need so much DSP that, you know, now we're um, using more power, I mean, it, so it's a trade-off. And, and these, are, these are things that need to be considered. It's just, it's not gonna be possible for us to answer these questions without working with people who, who also build the devices and, and have that domain specific insight. Otherwise we're just, you know, ma making up models and working with models, which I, I mean, I, I like that, especially when there's cold signal processing that won't lead to reduced energy consumption, I don't think. Great, thank you. Uh, Lefteris, you have a talk. You have a question. Yes. Uh, um, thank you, thank you, dear Robert, for this uh, great talk. I think you managed to uh, uh, to compress so much material, interesting and in material and ideas in a, in a few minutes. Um, I, I have a, a two short and rather naive questions. <laughs> My first question is: uh, uh, What is your opinion about the role of multi-carrier modulation in the in in in, in the in this latest uh, uh, generations of? Um, MIMO systems. Uh, I see that uh, I'm not an expert in this, but I see that uh, some people uh, in, uh, incorporate OFDM in massive millimeter wave MIMO, others consider it as something not really uh, um, uh, necessary. Uh, that's my first question. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just looking, well, let, maybe, maybe I'll ask the answer the first question first. Um, trying to find a good slide for this here, but I can't. Maybe it's this one here. Oh, no, here. I'll just put this one up here. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And I think, um, first of all, the, the multi-carrier modulation, OFTM and, and variations have been just, OFTMA have been hugely successful in wireless LAN and cellular, right? So there's no, no, no doubt about that. And it's all because of the signal processing that you can equalize the channel more efficiently. Main drawback being the um, peak to average power ratio and requiring more linearity than you otherwise would need. And if you look at the 60 gigahertz standards, um, 802.11ad and AY, for example, they had two modes, a mode which is single carrier cyclically prefix. So you can still do the OFDM like processing, but with a single carrier waveform and they have a multi-carrier option. And, and most people don't, multi-carrier is not mandatory and most people don't implement it. And the 15 um, 3D that I showed here has no multi-carrier option at all. So. I think for at least the higher bandwidths and the higher carriers, it's really hard sell to do multi-carrier modulation. I mean, if, if you can't design a power amplifier to get out enough power, you sure don't wanna back it off 10 dB because you just don't have enough there. Um, so I think we do need to look at that and it might even lead though to more extremes where we go back to continuous phase modulation or some other kinds of even more power efficient modulations. Um, I, I see that as being a good topic as well. Okay, my second question is, um, I, was, I mean, I, it, it, it was inspired by this uh, uh, figure on your first slide, where you showed, if I remember correctly, uh, some, some uh, brains on, at the top of, brain, of base stations. And uh, this uh, yeah, reminded yeah. me of, uh, yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, this, is, this reminded me of a recent paper I read about something called brain time communications. Uh, uh, maybe you are if you're aware of it, uh, there are some people that um, envision uh, systems where, uh, um, uh, I mean, it will be something like internet of brains, uh, the, the brains will have some chips and communicate to each other and with the, the base stations as well and with other devices. Um, maybe you could uh, comment on this. Uh, what is your opinion? 
Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's a great application of MIMO that that scares the hell out of me. Uh, <laughs> so I think I'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, Mark, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, Robert. Uh, very yeah, nice talk. Thanks very much. Um, so um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more generally about your 6GNC centre. How are you getting all the people to work together? Because it seems, you know, usually the signal processing people and the comms people and the materials and the nano people are all in different research groups and don't really talk to each other very much. But to make this yeah. stuff work, you have to bring people together in a way that normally we don't. How are you doing that at North Carolina? Yeah, well, um, at, so at North Carolina, we have exactly those different groups and they're uh, both the research and the, and the teaching parts are with the groups, those groups. And so there, there is some siloing of, of expertise, but it's really just about talking to people and explaining the, the problems from their point of view. So, you know, if, if I go to someone who's working with antennas and, and I say, look, you know, if we work together, um, we can do work that's more impactful and we're gonna get more money to do that work. You know, in the US is all about the money, right? We're always fighting to get more proposals funded and more research. And so I just think the simple, you know, it's in your self-interest to do more collaborative work because you're gonna have more impact and you're gonna get more funding and you're gonna get a better position. So that, that's really it. I mean, I, I don't know, it's, it's the usual kind of selling here, but but you just, you have to do it though. I mean, someone has to be willing to take that step. And and so what I've seen is that often the groups, you know, everyone's been in that group for a long time and they just used to, okay, those people are just over there and we just don't talk because we don't. And so that's why it's good when you move to a new place, you can just go in there and say, yo, guys, it's crazy that you're not talking. Let's, let's do it like this. And maybe they can tell you to go pound sand or they can, you know, <laughs> um, think about it. And, and so we've been putting together like a number of large proposals. And so that's been the way that I've been connecting with the, the other faculty and learning about what they do. And, um, and it's really great. And there's just so many um, new ideas to be had by um, expanding one's horizons a bit. And, and I think that, you know, we, we're in this phase where to some extent we're narrowing scope because we have this, this hammer called machine learning that seems to be able to, to pound every possible nail and everything, in fact, without knowing anything, um, which is scary. And, and I think that we're actually at the time where we need to know more about things and we can still use that hammer, but we can use it in a way that's gonna be much more efficient than if we just threw it to some computer science undergrads and said, hey, do some learning here and come back with the result. Um, I'm not even sure I answered the question, so. Uh, Oh, that's that. that's great. Thanks very much, Robert. Yeah, thanks, really nice talk. Thanks. Yes, uh, thanks everybody. So I think we have to uh, wrap up here. So thanks a lot for the questions and thanks Robert for uh, being with us uh, so early in the morning for you. Thank yeah, you thanks for everyone um, great, great putting job. up with me here. Appreciate it. So and right now there's the three minute uh, thesis competition if people are, are interested. And if you have more questions for Robert, there's also a conversation uh, window uh, on the website. So there you can put uh, more questions if you if you have some. Yeah, I'll, I'll check that um, periodically yeah. here. OK, great. So yeah. thank you, everybody. See you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Enjoy your day.